TBC. Welcome back to our journey through Acts. We are going to be in Acts 9 today, specifically verses 1 through 31. Don't worry, we're not going to skip the rest of Acts 9. That'll be in the next video. But today our focus is Saul. Now, if you remember with me, back to the end of chapter 7, after Stephen is stoned, we are told that a great persecution breaks out. So then at the beginning of chapter 8, we see that the believers are scattered away from Jerusalem. And everywhere they went, they took the gospel message with them. And so Acts 8, we see Philip going and sharing beyond Jerusalem. And we see Samaritans and an Ethiopian man come to faith. But here in Acts 9, we encounter again Saul. Now Saul first come, uh, shows up at uh, the very end of the account of Stephen's martyrdom. It says in 8.1, it says, And Saul approved of their killing him. And then he is mentioned as going to destroy the church. It says, verse 3, he, was, he went from house to house and dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And so driven by his zeal for the law and for the his Jewish upbringing and training, he wants to stamp out followers of Jesus. He wants to stamp out this movement anywhere it is. And so chapter 9 opens with Saul breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And so he went to the high priest and he requested letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that he could go there and arrest all of the followers of Jesus who were there. If you notice with me here in verse 2, the followers of Jesus are called those um, who belong to the way. This is the first time we see that phrase used here in Acts, and it'll be used six times. This phrase, the way, connotes this imagery of following in the way of Jesus. In John 14, 6, Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Isaiah 40, prepare the way of the Lord. So this image of the way and traveling along with God, with Jesus, those who are traveling along this path of discipleship are known as followers of the way. So Saul on his way to Damascus with letters. So these letters would have been uh, letters of uh, extradition to ask these synagogues for permission to take the followers of the way back to Jerusalem so that they could stand trial. And he's headed toward Damascus. Now Damascus was an ancient city with a very long history, and it was controlled by many different uh, nations over the centuries. And at this point, there are quite a few Jews, thousands of Jews, most likely, who were living there in Damascus. We're told he's asking for letters to the synagogues, so more than one. So there was more than one gathering place for these Jews. So Saul and his traveling buddies set out towards Damascus. And as they are going, Saul has a vision. A bright light comes, it says a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asks. And he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So Jesus appears to Saul here on the road to Damascus. While he is in the midst of breathing these murderous threats on his way to persecute the followers of Jesus. Jesus meets him in that moment. So this is the only post-Pentecost resurrection appearance of Jesus and is the last resurrection appearance of Jesus. So as a result of this vision, Saul is blind. He cannot see and he has to be led into the city. Those who were traveling with him saw the light 
and heard a sound, but they didn't see anyone. So I can imagine they were feeling confused, astonished, and then to see what happened to Saul as a result. They would have been impacted by this. Now, and this is the only point, like this is the last point we hear from these traveling companions, um, at least in this story. And I can just imagine that this scene stuck with them. And I can only hope that as they moved forward, as they watched Saul and how he responded and the change that God wrought in him, that they too would have been impacted and hope that they too became followers of the way. So they led him into Damascus and for three days he could not see and he did not eat or drink. But God didn't leave him in this state. There was a man in Damascus named Ananias and Ananias um, was a disciple and a follower of Jesus. And so God comes to Ananias and he tells him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man, man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Now put yourself in Ananias' shoes for a moment. How would you be feeling? You are in Damascus, probably have fled from somewhere, and you are there, and you hear that your arch enemy is coming, and you know that he's going to try to hunt down all of the followers of Jesus in your city. And now God is saying, hey, you know that guy? who has been hunting down all the Christians, well, hey, you're going to go and see him. You're going to willingly go to where he's staying and you're going to place your hands on him and restore his sight. I imagine Ananias was quite befuddled and probably a bit nervous about this word from the Lord. And so he asked God about it. I have heard so many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But God says, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So God takes the time to explain to Ananias. He doesn't get upset with him for asking or for being nervous or scared about it. He takes the time to explain. So Ananias obeys. I love this picture of Ananias and his obedience. God calls us to do hard things, things that make us uncomfortable sometimes. It's the way of Jesus. It's not a way of all that's all cheery and roses and easy. The way of Jesus is hard. Sometimes it involves us having to do hard things or forgive someone maybe we don't want to or talk to that person we maybe don't want to or suffer for our faith. The way of Jesus is not a get out of all bad things forever and all suffering forever card. The way of Jesus is the promise of Jesus with us in the midst. And as we obey and we walk with him, he gives us the strength. He gives us the ability because he's at work in us to do the things he's calling us to. And that's exactly what he does for Ananias here. Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he doesn't just go and begrudgingly do it. He goes, he says, Brother Saul. He embraces Saul as a brother, as a brother in Christ, and prays that he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because God has plans for this man from Tarsus, this well-educated Jew who has all of this zeal. God had plans for him. 
And so we see here that Saul is healed. His eyes are open, both physically, like something like scales fell from his eyes that he could see. But also spiritually, he's beginning to understand that Jesus is the Messiah. The one he was persecuting is actually the one he should be following. So he gets up, he is baptized, he eats something and regains his strength. Because it had been three days since he had eaten or drank anything. And he remains there in Damascus for several days. And he immediately begins to preach, go into the synagogues and proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the promised Messiah. And everybody is surprised. This is the guy who was coming to take away all the Christians and take them back to Jerusalem so that they could stand trial. And yet here he is following the one that he was persecuting. But it says he grew more and more powerful. That's verse 22 and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. And I love this picture because we, Paul will say later on in his letters, about more about his education and about how he was trained. He was trained as a Pharisee. He knew the law. He knew the words of scripture. He had been taught them. And yet here we see that as he begins to follow Jesus, God is able to transform him completely and use all of that training and all of that knowledge that he had spent all of his years accumulating and learning and sitting at the feet of rabbis and just um, being filled. God's able to use all of those things to then proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah, to prove that he is the Messiah. Paul knew all the right things to say. And now he had... Um, knowledge of the one who fulfilled all of the law. Now with all of his same passion and zeal, now channeled in the right direction, Saul goes out preaching and it does not take very long for him to be persecuted. We're told that there was a conspiracy among the Jews in Damascus to kill him, but the believers lowered him down through an opening in the wall in a basket so he could escape. And he went to Jerusalem eventually. And he tried to join the disciples there, but they were all afraid of him. And can you blame them? I mean, his first, their first instinct was probably like, he's just trying to get in on the inside so he can find out who we all are and then turn us all in. But Barnabas, the encourager, took and took him and brought him to the apostles. And he shared about what Jesus had done for him and how he had preached in the name of Jesus. And he stayed there and he was able to preach and teach in Jerusalem and speak boldly in the name of the Lord. Can you imagine what the chief priests and all of the religious leaders thought? Paul was not, Saul was not an unknown. They all knew him. They knew that he had gone out to persecute the church. And here he comes back believing. No wonder they were so upset. We're told that he talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. So once again, he is um, sent out. They send him down to Caesarea and and then off to Tarsus. So they kind of send him away to protect him. Because we know from what God told Ananias that God has a plan for Saul, that he is going to preach to the Gentiles and to the people of Israel and to kings and leaders. And we know from knowing his story that that is what will happen. And then this section of chapter 9 closes with another statement on the church. It says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. So you see a little bit of a calm here from a persecution standpoint. They enjoyed a time of peace. The church was strengthened. It it continued to grow. 
the Holy Spirit was at work and the message about Jesus was spreading further and further and more and more people are coming to know the truth. Next time we will finish up Acts 9 and move into 10 and 11. We're going to pick up the story of Peter and follow his journeys for a a little bit. So I hope you will join me again next week and I'll see you then. Bye.